Now, the story of Ethernet goes back some 32 years to May 22nd, 1973, when um, I wrote a memo at the Xerox Palo Alto Research Center uh, describing how Ethernet would work and, and naming it. Uh, it was my good fortune to be the first person in history given the job of networking a building full of personal computers. You have to remember that in 1973 there were no personal computers. So building on experience uh, with uh, the ARPANET, the original internet, and some uh, heavy reading into the, uh, the Aloha packet network at the University of Hawaii, uh, we set out to build a network uh, of personal computers at Xerox. Dave Boggs and I built the first Ethernet in 1973. Uh, our first two driving applications were a laser printer. We were building what I gather is the world's first laser printer, uh, which needed to be shared among um, these hundreds of personal computers. And we also had early Internet access. We wanted all of our PCs to be able to uh, access the Internet at high speed. So uh, we came up with uh, the Ethernet, which uh, ran on a big, thick coax that wandered down the middle of every corridor, and then the PCs in the individual rooms would then, through a cable, go up and tap into this big coax uh, running down the middle of the corridor. I think we were um, either lucky or very shrewd that we, we never referred to the coax as coax. We referred to it as the ether. We talked about sending packets up into the ether and having them uh, propagate everywhere. Uh, we call this the ether. Uh, we borrowed the word from physics. In the 19th century, uh, physicists believed that there was some uh, medium between the sun and the earth, which they called the luminiferous ether, uh, an omnipresent, completely passive uh, medium for the propagation of electromagnetic waves. Now that uh, we felt that this coax through the ceiling in 1973 was going to go everywhere and it was going to be completely passive and it was going to be a medium for the propagation of electromagnetic waves, namely the, the data packets that we wanted our personal computers to exchange. So that was the first uh, Ethernet, 73-74. Uh, Dave Boggs and I built it. In 1976, our first paper was published uh, in the communications of the ACM. And then... Uh, uh, in about 1979, uh, June of 79, I started 3Com Corporation to um, build Ethernet-compatible products uh, in, but could, because by then uh, Xerox and uh, a company called Digital Equipment Corporation and the Intel Corporation had decided to use Ethernet as a standard for the interconnection of their products. We created uh, IEEE Project 802 to make the Ethernet into a standard. And by December 1982, um, uh, there was now, there became an Ethernet standard that we used to um, start building products. And uh, then Ethernet started taking off. In September of 82, we shipped the first, uh, we 3 com shipped the first uh, Ethernet adapter for IBM personal computers. And by 1984, 3Com uh, went public. Uh, it was being so successful selling these Ethernet cards for PCs. Through the 1980s, uh, Ethernet then had to battle uh, uh, the token ring from IBM and, and other local area networks that uh, competed with it. And by the end of the 80s, Ethernet had won that battle uh, by adapting to market realities and shifting from coax to twisted pair. Uh, Ethernet finally uh, won the battle and uh, became the dominant local area network. The, of course, the Internet had a lot of growing to do, and say, starting about 1994, when the World Wide Web came out, then the, uh, the Internet really started growing, and people started buying personal computers, not so much uh, to do spreadsheets, but after about 1994, they started buying personal computers to be on the Internet. Uh, so over all this time, since 1973, let's see, that would be 32 years, Ethernet has been proliferating, and uh, more importantly, it's been evolving. In fact, it, it, Ethernet's evolved so much that today what people mean when they say Ethernet today bears uh, little resemblance to the, uh, the so-called CSMA CD technology that Dave Boggs and I uh, developed in uh, 1973. So more important than uh, Ethernet's past is its future and uh, where it's going. And I've come up with five prepositions uh, to describe the directions in which uh, Ethernet is now going. 
Those are, Ethernet is going uh, up and it's going through and it's going over and it's going down and it's going across all those directions. And let me summarize each of those. Uh, Ethernet continues to go up. It started in 1973 at 2.94 megabits per second. It then went to 10 megabits per second and then 100 megabits per second and a gigabit per second. And now Ethernet, standard Ethernet, runs at 10 gigabits per second. uh, And it's going to go higher. Uh, We can expect it to go to 40 or maybe 100 gigabits per second in its next generation. So Ethernet continues to go up, but it's also going through. That is, the wide, na- wide area networking, WAN infrastructure, is being uh, infused with uh, Ethernet equipment. The old uh, equipment that telephone companies used to use, the TDM Sonnet infrastructure, is gradually being replaced in the core by uh, Ethernet transport. So Ethernet's going up the LAN and through the WAN, but it's, uh, it's also... Um, going over the airwaves. It's becoming wireless, which is a little ironic in that Ethernet was derived from the Aloha packet radio network in 1970, which was wireless. It then went through uh, coax and twisted pair and optical fibers, and now Ethernet has come back to wireless again. So wireless Ethernet, more recently known as uh, IEEE 802.11 or Wi-Fi, and then right right behind that, WiMAX, So you have Ethernet going wireless, breaking free uh, 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 from uh, from wireline access to wireless access. Uh, Ethernet is also going um, down. We've uh, spent the last 30 years networking personal computers, but now Ethernet and its variations and descendants are now going to uh, network sub-personal Uh, microcontrollers or embedded microcontrollers, of which there are more than 8 billion shipped every year, those microcontrollers are today largely unnetworked and therefore less valuable and more expensive. Um, But we are uh, uh, moving toward getting even embedded microcontrollers networked, microcontrollers in automobiles, in ships, in uh, homes, in industrial control, in uh, homeland security, in uh, many thousands of applications we see those embedded microcontrollers being networked. And finally, uh, Ethernet is going across, uh, across what George Gilder called the telechasm. Here we have all this bandwidth being created in the LAN because Ethernet going faster and faster and faster. And here we have all this bandwidth in the WAN, the wide area network, being created through the proliferation of dense wave division multiplexing. But between the LAN and WAN has been this bandwidth chasm, the telechasm, Uh, that is, the connection between the LAN and the WAN as made available by carriers has been very slow. So, for example, you have dial-up, you've had dial-up service and more recently DSL and cable uh, cable modems and maybe even T1, but all those are very slow compared to the bandwidths available in the LAN and the WAN. So now we're taking Ethernet across the telechasm in an effort organized by the Metropolitan Ethernet Forum uh, and we're calling this carrier Ethernet. It's a, a version of Ethernet which reconciles the advantages of Ethernet with the requirements of um, service offerings from carriers so that carriers can offer a bridge across the telechasm. Um, 